thank you all for, uh, for staying through this long day. Uh, it's actually reminded me of an event that I last presented around 4.30. It was at a uh, academic conference in Switzerland. Uh, and over the course of this conference, the audience thinned out, such that by the end, when I got up on stage, there was one sole individual left in the audience. <laughs> I was so grateful. I said, someone's here, someone's interested in my work. Wonderful. So I got off the stage, I approached him, and I said, let's go grab a cup of coffee. Let me share with you my data. Let me share with you my insights. Let me give you all of my research, and we can have a nice, calm conversation about it. At which point he looked at me, started turning bright red, and said, Vikram, you don't understand. I'm on next. <laughs> I want to talk about uncertainty and the right way to think about it. The future, as we all know, is plagued with road signs like this. Have someone with perfect insight, and we've got you know, someone very rare in the world. In fact, I don't think we have any of such people. But it's unclear. And so this has been a problem for a long time. In fact, let's go back, rather than to the future, to the past. Let's go back 3,000 years, uh, where we had a Greek poet write this phrase, which is, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Actually, before I get into my interpretation of that, let me just share with you a, a little side note. I was uh, sharing this presentation with my wife, at, at which point, uh, very intelligent woman, she says, well, what's the one big thing? If the hedgehog knows one thing, I want to know what it is. I said, well, this is curious. I don't think I've ever looked. I don't think anyone's ever asked. I don't think we know. So I went ahead and I did some research. Turns out, totally separate from my talk, but let me just share this story anyway. Uh, turns out, this is about a competition between a fox trying to catch a hedgehog, and so it turns out the, the hedgehog tries to roll up in a little ball and with spiky um, porcupine-like quills, ends up repelling the, the fox, which is very wily at trying to catch. But then it also turns out, the more research I got, that in nature, occasionally the fox sees this and rolls the hedgehog down, down a hill into water, at which point the, the hedgehog needs to climb up swim out of the water, and the fox still catches them. So in any case, regardless of what actually happens, here's my interpretation of what we mean. <laughs> when we're talking about a fox, i.e. someone that knows many things, we're effectively talking about a generalist, someone that has been trained effectively, we can think of a liberal arts style tradition, but someone who knows lots of little things. If we're talking about a hedgehog, we're talking about a specialist. We're talking about someone who's got deep expertise in a specific domain of knowledge or a specific procedure or methodology. Uh, my area of interest has been financial booms and busts. And so I tend to think about financial markets as a domain of uh, massive uncertainty, probabilistic developments, uh, and chaos, really. It's hard to predict what's going to happen in financial markets. And so my approach to handling this problem has been to become a fox. And so I use multiple lenses in thinking about booms and busts. The lenses I use range from psychology to economics to culture, etc. Let me walk you through a handful of the insights that come out and some of the things we look for when studying bubbles if you're going to use multiple lenses. First one, if we were thinking of microeconomics, we would think of prices. Are prices rising too rapidly? Now, what I mean precisely by too rapidly is subject to some debate, but let's just say prices matter. Secondly, credit is the foundation upon which asset prices are rising. Is it based upon borrowed money? Well, we found out recently here in America and Greece and elsewhere that too much borrowed money can be a big problem. Finally, or not finally, uh, thirdly, hubris. What do I mean by hubris? Overconfidence. This time it's different. New era thinking, whatever we want to call it. This belief in thinking we know something when we actually do not. Uh, politics. Governments can distort incentives, whether it's through taxes, subsidies, uh, or other policies. They have a role to play in promoting bubbles and preventing them. Culture. There's various different elements we can think of when we think of culture, uh, but we can just think, for instance, 
Asian cultures happen to be more consensus oriented. They happen to be more harmonious, if you will. Uh, that has implications for group behavior. And finally, my last lens, uh, or last data point I would point you to is amateur investor participation is a good sign of herd behavior. And I'll show you what I mean by that. The nice thing about these lenses is you do not need to have a PhD in economics. You do not need to have a PhD in psychology. You don't need to be an expert in any of them. Just having a great enough insight to understand that in aggregate, the generalist, meaning anyone with a uh, insight into thinking in this way can have a, a, have a profound impact on understanding the likelihood of a boom-bust sequence taking place. So let me begin by sharing with you a couple of fun indicators. My first indicator is the world's tallest skyscraper. We've heard about architecture, we've heard about buildings, we've heard about space today. Uh, well, this is an indicator that seems to work for very good reasons. Now there's deep academic research behind it, but let me share with you my insight as to why this indicator works. Turns out the world's tallest skyscrapers are good manifestations of one, borrowed money. Skyscrapers are rarely built with 100% equity financing. Usually there's a bank or someone lending money to the developer. Number two, they're speculative. They're usually built by developers. We don't hear about large companies building huge skyscrapers and moving their entire worldwide staff into them. And finally, by being the world's tallest, there's an element of hubris and overconfidence involved. And that's something I'll show you has really powerful impacts. So for good reasons, this is an indicator that seemingly should work. Well, so let's look at it in history and see what's happened. This is, uh, these are three pictures here. Uh, the top left is uh, 40 Wall Street. Uh, the bottom left is uh, the Chrysler Building, and then on the, the right is a picture of the Empire State Building. Turns out these three buildings competed for the world's tallest tower status in 1929 going on to 1930. That, of course, as we know, led or telegraphed the Great Depression. Uh, in 73 and 74, we had the Sears Tower and then the World Trade Centers. That was followed by a decade of stagflation. In 1997-98, the world's tallest tower status shifted to Asia, to Malaysia. The Petronas Towers became the tallest towers in the world, not far from the center of the Asian financial crisis. Um, on the right-hand side here is a picture of Taipei 101. Built Taipei, known as sort of the center of tech hardware, this is a tower that was built in 1999 right at the beginning, right at the sort of start of the final last stages of the tech boom. And then perhaps one of the most recent manifestations and one of my favorite is this tower. This was known as the Burj Dubai, uh, later renamed because it had to get bailed out, actually, uh, into the Burj Khalifa. But this, is, this went up uh, and was deemed the world's tallest tower, freestanding structure, prior to completion in July of 2007. That was, and it, by the way, it happened within weeks of global equity markets hitting their relative highs. Uh, so why has this happened? Again, easy money, borrow, speculative tendencies, and hubris. This building is a great manifestation of irrational exuberance, right? This is 164 stories tall. By the way, do you know what the view is from the top? The same as it would be if you were on the 100th floor, because it's all <laughs> sand. This is a desert, right? I mean, come on, let's think about this. Uh, has the world's tallest elevator, world's longest elevator, etc. cetera. Uh, so anyway, this is irrational. But by the way, this is not the only indicator. Let me give you another fun indicator. Something that all of you can access to with an internet connection and a browser. Pull up a stock chart of Sotheby's. Sotheby's is the auction house, over 200 years old. Uh, went public in 1988. As you can see from this chart, it's basically a line with four blips on it, right? Almost like a seismograph. And so the first blip occurred in 1989, and it came back down. The second blip occurred in 1999 and came back down. The third blip occurs in 2007, and then the most recent blip occurred in May of 2011. Well, those dates are somewhat interesting, aren't they, if you're interested in booms and busts? And so when I go back and I look at what was happening to the art markets in 1989, it turns out we had Japanese art buyers 
paying world record prices for art. Not surprisingly, Sotheby's, an auction house, did really well. In 1999, we had tremendous wealth generation in the technology, media, and telecom space. Not surprisingly, that had an impact on the art markets, and it was reflected here in Sotheby's stock. 2007, beneficiaries of easy money. What do I mean by that? I mean hedge fund billionaires. I mean private equity billionaires. I mean Russian oligarchs, people who benefited from having easy access to capital. Telegraphed through setting world record art prices a credit bubble. That happened before the markets really fell. May 2011. Now the question is, am I trying to peer into the future by saying this? I don't know. Uh, this is all uncertain, as I said earlier. But Chinese art buyers stepped up and were buying art at world record prices. Next indicator. As I said, anyone, you do not need to have a PhD in these topics, you don't need to have a degree in these topics. You should just understand this is a framework for thinking about probabilistic, generalist style approaches to uh, reflecting on booms and busts. Taxicab drivers are a great indicator. What do I mean by that? Generally, one of the lenses I suggest using is amateur investor participation telegraphs the final stages of a bubble. Well, if your taxi cab driver's talking to you about internet stocks, don't buy them. It's too late. You know, I was in Miami in uh, 2007 and the, the taxi cab driver was talking to me about buying and selling condos. Not a good time to buy and sell condos. Uh, so taxi cab drivers, good, talk to them. Talk to all your taxi cab drivers. Uh, magazine covers, another great indicator. I live in Boston. This is a magazine cover from uh, uh, Boston Magazine that came out in May of 2006. Quite near the top of the housing markets, suggesting one should buy, buy, buy. What you should have done was sell, sell, sell. Um, so let me wrap up here by describing what I think is important. Um, and that's for how one should think about making decisions in times of uncertainty. Turns out Harry Truman, um, was a president that faced massive uncertainty, took office uh, in the midst of you know, a prior president dying. It was uh, the middle of a world war. He was charged with deciding whether or not to drop atomic bombs. He then uh, you know, had developed the Marshall Plan. This was a time of massive global uncertainty and change. Well, he had lots of advisors. And what he found was his advisors would all step up and say, on the one hand, we should do this. On the other hand, we should do that. On the one hand, if we do this. On the other hand, if we do that. It frustrated him to no end that he once was caught coming out to his advisors and effectively trying to get rid of all of them and said, I need a one-armed economist because I'm getting one-handed this, one-handed that. Just give me one with one hand. <laughs> and so um, really what I'm suggesting is the opposite. I'm suggesting become your octopus analyst. Have multiple hands. Take multiple approaches. Because as we look forward to uncertainty and deciding within domains of uncertainty, I want you to start thinking like a fox. Take a generalist approach. There's a lot more insight in what you know. And it can be used in a very valuable way. So embrace foxy thinking. Thank you. <laughs>